Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to our um, TSC uh, seminar for the, the week. Um, and I'd especially like to welcome our three presenters. We have a, um, three presenters from INERA today uh, talking about uh, structural analysis of multimode Medellica models. Um, so our presenters today are Albert Benveniste, uh, who was the director of INERA from 1979 to 2014. He is currently emeritus. Um, Albert is uh, IEEE and IFAC fellow. IFAC is the International Federation for Automatic Control uh, and has been elected to the French National Academy of Engineering. He's made many contributions to signal processing and control, mechanics, embedded system design, um, and his current interests are in the design of hybrid systems and modelers, particularly in the Modelica language. Uh, Benoit Callot is a uh, also at ENIRA since 1997. Um, he's currently senior researcher and his interests include hybrid system modeling and verification, and especially as we'll see today, uh, scalable analysis algorithms uh, useful for compiling uh, hybrid uh, Modelica models uh, for purposes of simulation and, and analysis. And Matthias uh, Maladain uh, earned his PhD in, in 2013 from INSA in Rouen, France. Uh, in the area of uh, incompressible fluid flow, also a, a topic of a lot of interest here at Merle, uh, and is currently uh, an expert engineer in mathematics and software at Anira, and he, his interests also include uh, analysis of large-scale multi-mode Medellica models. And so I will now uh, turn it over to the three of you. Well, thank you, Scott, for the, for the introduction. I would like to thank uh, the organizers of the seminar for the very kind uh, invitation. And we are very pleased uh, to present our current work on uh, structural analysis of uh, multimode uh, Modelica models. So I am uh, Benoit Caillot and I will uh, start uh, the presentation uh, with just a, a brief introduction on uh, the benefits of using uh, differential algebraic equations uh, rather than uh, ordinary differential equations when modeling uh, multiphysics uh, systems. So I guess you all know the Simulink uh, language and you have here a Simulink model of some uh, physical system. And uh, what you can immediately see is that you don't get the uh, organic uh, architecture of, uh, of a physical device that is uh, modeled here. It is not, uh, it is not uh, apparent. And uh, this comes from the fact that in order to, to model the physical system so using ordinary differential equations, you have to put the system into a state space form. And uh, this completely changes the, the mathematical structure of, uh, of your model. And this has uh, a big, uh, and, and this is a big problem in terms of uh, reusability of, uh, of models of uh, physical systems. In contrast, when you are using uh, DAEs, so for instance, uh, by using the, the Modelica language, you can uh, encapsulate the physics uh, of each uh, component of your system into a, into a class. And uh, then your system is just some assembly of a set of instances of class interconnected by connectors and your model and the architecture of your model exactly reflects the uh, organic uh, architecture of your of a physical uh, device that is uh, being uh, modeled. And so uh, this tells you that uh, you will have uh, much better uh, reusability of the model, but uh, this comes with a drawback is that it, it puts uh, higher burden on the tools, and in particular, uh, Modelica uh, tools have to perform at compile time a structural uh, analysis of, uh, of the DAE um, in order to uh, generate uh, efficient uh, simulation code. So 
now let's uh, focus on the multimode aspect of uh, some uh, physical models. So I use the term uh, multimode because it is uh, uh, the term that is being used in the Modelica community. But uh, the terms uh, switched systems or hybrid systems are synonyms. So uh, uh, they mean uh, the same thing. So you naturally find uh, multimode or switch uh, systems when you are uh, modeling uh, some mechanical uh, phenomena. So for instance, uh, Coulomb friction. Uh, so <coughs> multimode models uh, naturally uh, arise uh, when you model uh, dry uh, friction in uh, multibody mechanical systems. Uh, but also when you are modeling uh, thermodynamics and in particular uh, multiphase uh, thermodynamics. So uh, here you have some kind of a steam drum and you have here uh, two phases, uh, steam and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the liquid. But uh, the, the mathematical structure of the model completely changes when one of the two phases uh, disappear. And this is really uh, a difficulty when you want to model uh, such uh, thermodynamics. You also have uh, uh, multi switched uh, dynamics when you are modeling uh, circuits, such as uh, hydraulic circuits or uh, electrical uh, circuits, because you uh, want to uh, capture uh, instantaneous uh, switchings uh, either uh, of the uh, electrical circuits or uh, opening or closing valves. When you want to uh, model uh, possible uh, failures of your components in, uh, in your system, uh, you uh, uh, will uh, use uh, multimode uh, modeling. And uh, more generally, when you are dealing with open systems, so here a smart grid, uh, where uh, consumers and producers can uh, dynamically join or leave the network, uh, you will have to uh, consider uh, switched uh, dynamics. And the difficulty is that although uh, all the facilities that uh, have been introduced in the Modelica language uh, several years ago. Uh, the handling of uh, multimode uh, Modelica models is far from perfect uh, for um, state of the art uh, Modelica tools. Uh, to understand what is the essence of the difficulty, we'll start with a very, very simple example. It's uh, just uh, eight lines, uh, seven lines with uh, two equations and two variables. So we have one real variable X, one Boolean variable P. Uh, the Boolean variable is defined as a function of, uh, of the real variable and the dynamics of the real variable is defined by the second uh, equation. So initially X is initialized to zero and so the initial value of P is false. I've also uh, forced it here just for a compatibility issue between tools. And uh, um, so initially P is false and it is the, the else part of this, uh, this equation that defines the dynamics of X. So X increases from zero to right of one until it reaches uh, one. And there, the Boolean P changes value and becomes false. And now it's the then part that defines the dynamics. So this model is uh, perfectly fine. It is a fine uh, Modelica model. And this is the expected behavior of the model. Let's see what you obtain with a state of the art uh, Modelica tool. So we have tried uh, several of them and we obtain uh, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, phenomenon. And actually you get an exception at time t equal one. So when the Boolean switches from 
true to uh, from false uh, to true, and you get a division by zero uh, error. Uh, why is that? That's a bit weird. So let's see in detail the, the root cause of the problem. The, the problem actually comes from the structural analysis of this model that is performed by uh, Modelica compilers. Essentially, uh, structural analysis algorithms are uh, oblivious to, uh, the, to the modes. So they consider that this equation, uh, so the, the numerical equation is a smooth equation, is treated as a smooth equation. And uh, the structural uh, analysis uh, finds that uh, X prime, so uh, is uh, the leading variable. It is the unknown that needs uh, to be solved. And uh, this, this equation is used to compute X prime. Uh, but of course, when P is true, uh, this equation cannot be used to uh, compute the value of X prime because it is a singular, uh, it is a singular in, in X prime when P is true. And so this explains uh, why you get the division by zero error, uh, T, T equal one. What you should do instead is an exact uh, structural uh, analysis that takes care of the modes and that distinguishes uh, the structure of the model uh, into the two different modes of this, uh, of this system. So when P is false, indeed, the, the equation can be used to compute the value of X prime. And X prime is the leading variable when P is false, but when P is true, the leading variable is X and, uh, the, and, and not X prime. So, uh, so we understand the, the difficulties and the limitations of uh, current modelica tools that uh, uh, do not implement uh, an exact multimode structural uh, analysis. Uh, so we have been working uh, since uh, 2018 on a, a practical a structural uh, analysis uh, algorithms uh, for multimode uh, DAE systems. And uh, so, so um, and uh, taking into account uh, a major difficulty of uh, a multi-mode system is that the number of modes is in general an exponential function of the size uh, of a model. If you have n equations, you, you will have to uh, you will have an order uh, you will have a number of modes that is in the order of an exponential of uh, of a number of equations and. Uh, it's, uh, we designed uh, an algorithm that avoids uh, enumerating modes and considers actually the set of modes uh, as a whole. Uh, and uh, we are currently working on extensions of this uh, algorithm to take care also of the mode changes because the structural analysis also has to be done uh, at the instance of uh, mode changes. And again, we should avoid uh, enumerating all of the possible mode uh, changes. So I will, uh, so, so Matthias will now uh, give you a gentle introduction to a structural analysis of uh, single mode DA systems, and then we move to the multi-mode case. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll do my best. Um, so, uh, we need to better understand what is structural analysis, and uh, this is something that uh, some people do not really understand, so a simplified way of seeing this is by starting with uh, the very famous example uh, in the literature of a uh, pendulum uh, in a plane, and it is described uh, in the obviously corny way with uh, Cartesian coordinates. 
So basically, you have three variables, which are x and y, the coordinates of the mass, and lambda, that is a uh, that represents the tension in the rod, and the rod is of fixed length. So you have two differential equations for the dynamics and one algebraic equation for uh, basically the constraint that your rod cannot change length. For solving this system, uh, the leading variables in this system are basically the highest uh, differentiations, let's say, of your variables. So here we have uh, the second derivatives of x and y and uh, lambda by itself appearing in the system. And in order to be able to solve this system, you should uh, solve these equations for these variables. And when you compute the Jacobian matrix of the system with respect to these variables, there's an obvious problem that is uh, the Jacobian is singular. So the system cannot be solved as is. And in fact, what we can uh, guess here is that the problem comes from, uh, in this case, the algebraic equation. We should have leading variables appearing uh, in the third equation, and we do not. So one basic idea that we could have is that by differentiating the last equation twice, we would be able to bring back leading variables into an equation that didn't show any. And so let us differentiate this equation twice, and then the leading variables have not changed. We did not differentiate x to an order greater than 2, same for y. But now the Jacobian matrix is non-singular. So this uh, version, let's say, of the system is amenable to numerical solving. And so time simulation is now possible. And the basic idea of this analysis that is performed on DAE systems is uh, how to differentiate uh, in a clever way some equations so that you will get a system whose Jacobian matrix is non-singular. Uh, the question that holds now is how to make this automatic, what algorithms can you find in order to perform this analysis, and how can you make it lightweight, because you do not wish to uh, actually uh, differentiate the exact equations. And so the solution that was proposed near the end of the 1980s was uh, abstracting away the exact equations and working on uh, a structural version of these equations. And the structural version of equations is only what variables appear in what equations and what are the associated differentiation orders. So in the pendulum example, we could represent this as a matrix that will be filled uh, on the bottom left corner. Or you could show this as a bipartite graph with equation nodes on one side and nodes corresponding to the variables on the other side. These two representations will be perfectly equivalent. And so now let us fill the first row of the matrix. The first row corresponds to the first equation. In the first equation, we have the second derivative of x, the zeroth derivative of lambda, and y does not appear. And so the corresponding coefficients will be the maximum orders of differentiation, or it could just be zero minus infinity, sorry, if the variable does not appear in the equation. The equivalent representation on the graph side is basically adding an edge between an equation and a variable if the variable occurs in the equation, and the weight of this edge will be the maximal differentiation order. And if this is repeated on all equations, we get two equivalent representations that are structural representations of the system. We abstract away uh, the specifics of the equations and we only keep the information about the occurrence of variables in equations. And this is actually what the term structural refers to in structural analysis. And this is the basis of all uh, the structural analysis algorithms that exist and that have been developed since the 1980s. So we are kind of lifting the curtain here and watching how the modelic tools in particular will handle uh, the problem of turning a mix of differential and algebraic equations into a system that will be amenable to numerical solving. 
And several methods exist uh, for finding adequate orders of differentiation for the equations from this structural information. The one we will be focusing on is called the Sigma method. It was uh, designed and uh, it was published in 2001 by uh, John Price. And the idea is that basically in two pretty simple steps, uh, the system can be turned into its OD-like form. So the first step is finding a matching between the equations and the variables. It has to be perfect in the sense that uh, every uh, equation must be matched to a single variable and vice versa. And the weight, that is the sum of the weights of the edges, has to be maximum. And at this stage, you may choose any maximum weight perfect matching if you have several. And then step two of the algorithm is applying actually a pretty simple algorithm uh, that will update integer values for, uh, for uh, variables that we will be calling the CIs and the DJs. There's one CI for each equation and one DJ for each variable. And there's a pretty simple algorithm uh, the step going from the CIs to updating the DJs is basically uh, maximizing a sum and on each column of uh, the matrix and uh, going back from the DJs to the CIs is basically performing uh, one subtraction per equation. So then just lather, rinse and repeat this process until a fixed point is reached and you get uh, values for the CIs and the DJs that give you the results we expected. That is, the CIs are the differentiation orders that you want from, uh, for the equations. And this is exactly the result we guessed by hand, let's say. That is, the third equation should be differentiated twice in order to get a system that is solvable. And uh, the DJs are the orders of the leading variables. So here, we have the second derivative of the first and second variables, x and y, and lambda is kept undifferentiated. And this is applied to larger systems in order to get, uh, it, it's actually how the structural analysis is performed behind the curtain uh, by Modelica tools. At least that's one of the possible methods for this analysis. And uh, now, the issue we handle specifically is how to switch to multi-mode systems because now we have several changes. Uh, the equations themselves are mode dependent. So in this uh, pretty simple example of a circuit in which you want to model a possible failure of a component, uh, you will at the moment of a mode change, one differential equation will be replaced with uh, an algebraic equation. So the structure of the system changes in the sense that the structural information will change. And so the results of the structural analysis may not be the same in each mode. And this is a source of uh, runtime exceptions with the current state of the art modality tools. And the pretty small example that was presented by Benoit at the very beginning of this presentation. Uh, was a very, a very small example in which we have exactly this issue. And then going further, variable structure systems in which even the number of equations and variables uh, can change is even a further problem uh, for which Modelica currently does not uh, provide a one-size-fits-all solution in the sense that only fixed-size models are currently accepted in Modelica. And so we wanted to be able to design structural analysis method that would be able to handle efficiently uh, these uh, multi-mode systems. There are some possibilities that were uh, wiped out pretty quickly uh, for our works at least. The first one would be just omitting the mode dependencies, uh, but this would amount to exactly the approximate structural analysis that is implemented in state-of-the-art uh, Modelica tools with the kind of results that we already saw. An a safe uh, possibility would be enumerating the modes and performing one structural analysis for each mode but because of the combinatorial explosion of the number of modes, that would be uh, quickly untractable. 
uh, another solution was proposed uh, consisting in basically kind of a just-in-time compilation. So uh, the idea would be that at runtime, every time a mode change uh, is detected, uh, the structural analysis in the new mode is performed so that uh, simulation code can be generated on the fly uh, for the new mode. Uh, there are a few issues uh, with this approach, or let's say at least a few limitations, one of which is a possible, uh, a possibly large computational overhead at runtime. Uh, another limitation is that um, if a multimodal model uh, that somebody wrote is incorrect in not all modes, but in a few modes, it's incorrect. Maybe in some modes you have too many equations or maybe too few equations. This is not something that will be detected at compile time, but something that may uh, be detected at runtime if it so happens that uh, during the simulation, the system goes to one of these faulty modes. And um, we advocate that diagnostics uh, should be provided at compile time, which is why we went to another approach, which is basically uh, representing the mode dependent structure of the system in an implicit way. Uh, I will say a few words about this specific aspect. And then uh, finding a way to perform the structural analysis in an all modes at once fashion. Uh, this ought to be performed uh, as efficiently as possible uh, because this is something we would like to perform at compile time in order to be able to uh, provide diagnostics for uh, models that are not uh, well determined in all modes in order to help the designer um, tweak their models. So a bit more detail, but I will not de delve into too many details on this. Uh, but basically, uh, the idea is that when you have a multi-mode system, you can still extract uh, its structural uh, information. But this time, instead of having simple integers that will tell you the maximum orders of differentiation of variables in equations, uh, these integers will become integer functions of all the possible modes of your system. And so this is something that we wanted to represent efficiently without having to enumerate the mode, the modes, sorry. And so uh, we got help from uh, binary decision diagrams, a data structure that's actually more from the verification side. And uh, these binary decision diagrams are a helpful data structure for uh, representing uh, the structure of a multi-mode DAE system in a compact way and uh, providing efficient ways on, of computing on them. And this was absolutely needed to alleviate combinatorial explosion because this also helps us representing a, an exponential number of modes in a linear number of uh, variables. And then we work on these functions and we adapted the algorithms that are used for uh, the sigma method for structural analysis uh, in order to make them work for uh, on functions of the modes so that in a way uh, the structural analysis is performed on all modes at the same time. And so we published uh, an article that's actually proceeding for HSCC 20 uh, that, um, that explains how uh, the structural information of a multimodal DA is stored and how algorithms are designed on top in order to perform the structural analysis in this almost at once fashion. This is something pretty lengthy to explain. So uh, please excuse me for uh, skipping this tough part. This has been implemented in a tool called ISMDI uh, that can be uh, tried and experimented with uh, online. So this is uh, the second link provided in this slide. And we will, of course, provide you uh, with uh, these links. Um, we got 
uh, as soon as the structural analysis was uh, implemented, we got pretty encouraging results on uh, multiple models, especially models that were uh, parametric. Uh, one of the models we work with the most, and that illustrates this box, is a pretty simple thermal model of a building with N rooms uh, connected to a single central corridor. And uh, we consider the openings and closings of the doors between the rooms and the corridor as, uh, as instantaneous switchings. And so um, we got pretty encouraging results. And then we hugely benefited from a novel compositional algorithm that will, um, in a very few words, kind of decompose the problem uh, in a clever way into parts that can be uh, then uh, solved in a specific fashion. And uh, we actually gained several orders of magnitude. And so the results we got was that we reach uh, computational times that are, let's say, empirically polynomial uh, in the number of equations. But uh, meanwhile, the number of modes is exponential in the number of equations. And so uh, the tool is currently able to perform the structural analysis of all modes at once for systems that have uh, a few uh, thousand uh, equations for the moment, but we're still working hard on scaling up the algorithms. But even with these few thousand equations, we already handle more than 10 to the 150 modes at the same time, which would be more than intractable if we had to enumerate the mode in any way. Uh, the main current limitation of the tool is that there's yet no structural analysis of mode changes that is implemented, but uh, algorithms are on the works in the team, and this is where I let Albert present us uh, our works on the mode changes. Do you hear me? Yes. Not okay? Okay. So I will be discussing structural analysis of mode changes. First of all, by uh, not considering the issue of uh, uh, dealing with uh, combinatorial explosion of modes. So I will look into a very simple and basic example so that you can understand the method. So let me investigate uh, again a simple example for illustration. And it is, uh, uh, consists of an ideal clutch for which you have uh, the model shown here. For the, each shaft, you have the autonomous dynamics, which consists of a single equation. And then you have the model of the junction in the middle that says that if gamma is true, gamma is true means that the clutch is engaged. Then the two rotational velocities, omega one and omega two should be equal. The torques to one and to two should sum up to zero. And otherwise, if the clutch is released, then the two motions are free. There is no constraint on the relative constraint on the velocity and the torques are zero. So this is the model that we are going to consider. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you try to rewrite this model in a state space form, you will see again uh, the complexity that uh, Benoit mentioned at the beginning appearing. So let me focus on, uh, you have the two modes that are shown here. So for the structural analysis of mode changes, uh, we are bothered by the fact that we have to deal with a mix of two different kinds of time. First, continuous time when the clutch is either engaged or released, and then the events that are caused by the changes in the mode from engaged to uh, released and released to engaged when you operate on the clutch. So our first idea was to uh, uh, shift all the problem to discrete time 
in order to avoid the uh, different uh, nature of time for the two types of phases. So the idea is to discretize the system and not to be bothered by uh, discretization errors. Our idea was to consider what is called an infinitesimal time step, epsilon. And here I will discretize the real line with this infinitesimal time step and consider the shifted, okay, and consider the shifted version of x of t, which is defined of x of t plus epsilon. So it's kind of the z transform. And here it's the, uh, you have in the opposite side, the z to the minus one by the bullet on the left side. And the derivative is represented by considering the first order explicit Euler scheme for it. So one over epsilon times x bullet minus x. And now this is the interpretation that we do in the model of the clutch that is now shown here as at once. Here you have the first shaft, the second shaft, and then the model of the junction with these two modes engaged and released. And what I've done here as a preliminary step, but that was discussed by Matthias, is to perform the index reduction, the structural analysis of the mode change when the clutch is engaged by adding the latent equation obtained by differentiating the uh, constraint that the two uh, velocities should be equal. We could equally well, instead of using first order derivative, differentiating this equation, we could equally well shift it forward once in time, just because the shift and differentiation are related in a mutually invertible way. So structurally, you get exactly the same effect of index reduction. Okay, you should consider that uh, if, uh, x prime or x bullet are two equivalent represent representations of the leading bias. So we either work with e prime three differentiation or with the shifted bias, and then the rest of the model is there. So we choose the first uh, version in case we are within the AE mode, and this corresponds to the explanation by Matthias before, but at mode change, you will see why, we will be using the alternative version of it, namely the shifting of the constraint to get the latent equation. So this is the model that we get. And what we do to study the mode change is to unfold the model by including in blue the dynamics before the mode change and in black the dynamics resulting from the mode change. So here we have the release mode where the torques are zero and there is no constraint of velocity. And here we have the dynamics on the engage mode in which we have the constraint on velocity, the shifted version of it to make it uh, structurally regular, and then the constraint on the torques. Okay. So what happens with this model? Uh, remember that uh, because omega prime is interpreted by using the first order Euler scheme, the bullet version of omega prime is equal, is given by this formula, namely that the most recent value is omega, and the previous value is bullet left omega, which is omega at time t minus epsilon. Okay. So keeping this in mind, we can see that there is a conflicting subsystems involving the three equations with a star. 
here we have omega one and omega two involved, no torque. And in the first equation, we have omega one that results from expanding this left bullet derivative using the Euler scheme. So omega one is present here, omega one occurs here, and tau bullet is not a leading variable because we are not considering uh, the leading variable from previous instant, but only the leading variable from the current instant here, the new one. So here we get a conflict with these three equations involving the variable of these two instant system, which are omega one, omega two, omega one bullet, omega two bullet, tau one and tau two, there are five of them. So to handle this conflict, uh, we could reject the model, but this is not, uh, this would not be the good uh, policy to adopt. And uh, the idea is that to resolve the conflict, we have to remove one of the equations and we give priority to the past. For causality reason, we are not going to change the behavior in the past, but we can let the system wait to satisfy the new constraint that results from the new dynamics. Okay, this is what we are going to do here. So if we do this, then we end up with a final model for restart that is useful to derive how the model should be restarted. And it consists of the new equation, the new mode for the two shafts and only the constraints omega one bullet, omega two bullet, and tau one plus tau two equals zero. And these are the four equations shown here. And essentially, this is a regular model. You have, oh, sorry. You have four equations and uh, four dependent variables, which are omega one and two bullet, and tau one and tau two. And this is structurally invertible. So what can we do in the general case? Then let's see what kind of reasoning we should have to apply. We need to find conflicting subsystems. And for this, again, the technique consists in abstracting it as its incidence graph. So it is shown here, you have the assignment the involvement into a variable into the different equations that are shown in red here. Here you have no variable because tau one and tau two are considered as uh, states. And here you have the variable shown. And here you just perform what is called the dolmage Mendelssohn decomposition of this algebraic system of equation seen as a structural system uh, which decomposes this system as its underdetermined part, its regular part, and its overdetermined part. And the overdetermined part would consist exactly of the three stars uh, listed here that would be formed by this uh, Delmage Mendelssohn decomposition. So, in general, uh, we consider a restricted class of multimode system in which long modes of DAE dynamics alternate with finite cascades of transient mode because mode change sometimes should operate in more than one instant. For instance, if you have higher order derivatives, you need more steps to do the reset. <coughs> Now, what, what do we have to do in a given time slice in red in handling one mode change? We would unfold the dynamics over this time slice. This gives you an array of equations. We add the latent equation in long mode. This is the sigma method that we heard about. We perform the image Mendelssohn decomposition. This eliminates conflicting equation from the long exit mode. 
if it is still conflicting, then we need to return the conflict to the user. And this is a diagnostics that the model is uh, ill-designed. Else, we perform another damage Mendelssohn decomposition on the remaining subsystem after erasing the conflicting equation. If it is structurally irregular, then we have success and we can evaluate the new value. Else, we return to the user the restarts at which variables are under determined. Okay, and we have in our paper, I, I won't be discussing this here, but we have examples of uh, systems in which this last case here can occur from a practical standpoint. So regarding uh, the implementation of uh, this uh, algorithm in an efficient way in uh, all in one's mode fashion, we already have the multi-mode sigma method that was presented by Matthias and is already implemented in, in the tool is Amdai. And then what we are uh, currently uh, developing is a multi-mode Dolmetsch Mendelssohn decomposition. So this is already in the tool, but its application to the entire uh, change mode structural analysis is not performed yet. So this is the same approach that we use for the two algorithms. One problem uh, comes with the, uh, with the uh, mode change uh, in multi-mode system, which is the existence of impulsive behavior. In the case of the ideal clutch, we have this, uh, when the, I mean, the physics tells you that there is such a problem, because when you engage the uh, clutch, there is an abrupt changes in the velocity so that the two velocity in instantaneously become equal. And as a result, the torques will be infinite for an instant. So they are impulsive. And the question is how should you, what analysis is needed to generate correct uh, simulation code for such impulsive behavior. This is what I'm going to discuss right now. So this is the model I ended up with for the clutch for the release to engage uh, uh, <clears throat> mode change. And these are the equations that we have to solve for tau one and tau two, omega one bullet and omega two bullet. And then as a result, we will take the new value for restart, omega plus after mode change as being omega i bullet. Okay, so this is exactly what we need to do a correct restart. So let's expand the derivative. We end up with this equation. And now uh, the idea is that uh, we are bothered. Uh, this is not something that we can implement because tau the, excuse me, the epsilon is an infinitesimal. So infinitesimal is something is not something that the computers can compute about. So the question is that this is not executable code and you need to massage it to get, to make it, uh, to become something that can be computed by a computer. So what can we do? Epsilon is infinitesimal. So the first stupid idea is that uh, we can replace it by zero because if it's small, let's neglect it. However, if you do this, you end up with a singular system. So this cannot, it makes it structurally singular. Velocities and torques become independent and they, this cannot give a solution. The reason is that because we have uh, finite values for the uh, rotation speed, Velocities and in epsilon is infinitesimal. At the instant of mode change, where you we compute the restart, the tau i is a number that is, so to say, infinitely large, which can be made rigorous in mathematics. And this captures the fact that it corresponds to an impulsive behavior. So there are three alternative solutions to this problem, which all give as a final result, essentially the formula that we have here, which corresponds what uh, could be guessed if you understand a bit about the physics of the system. 
So we get the correct restart formula without any physical reasoning. So it's really physics agnostic, but still correct. And it reflects the preservation of the angular momentum. So the three techniques are the following. The first one is to eliminate the impulsive variable from the dynamics. So this can be done here because uh, it, it, the system, uh, the model, excuse me, has been cho chosen to be linear for this case. And therefore we can do the elimination and we end up with exactly the equation that we say. Here we have the epsilon appearing in the second member of the equation. And now we can safely set epsilon equal to zero and we get something that is regular. <laughs> okay, so this is the first method. Then an alternative consists in replacing the infinitesimal by something small and computing brute force. As a difficulty, you get something that is poorly conditioned. So which gives you stiffness uh, in the solver that is known to be a source of difficulty. And the other possibility is to rescale the impulsive variable by if you know the order of magnitude of how tau should be. And uh, if you are able, in this case, a hand reasoning would be make it possible to notice that in fact, if you multiply the infinite tau by delta and uh, do the change of variable replacing it by tau hat, then rescaling would give you a uh, regular system and well condition. And that would improve the uh, numerical conditioning of the system. Okay, I think it's becoming a bit too late to go through the details of uh, what can be done in general. Let's just say that uh, in uh, the slides I'm skipping here, I give indication of how to make this systematic for general models. And, uh, but this is not implemented yet. And this uh, remains to be implemented uh, in the future. But we have, we have a calculus that uh, again gives a compile time impulse analysis of the system and that allows you to discover prior to simulation what would be the order of magnitude of the impulsive variable and to take advantage of this to generate good code. Benoit. Okay, so thank you Albert. So it's time to, to conclude. Uh, so we, we have introduced you to uh, practical and efficient uh, structural uh, analysis uh, algorithms uh, for multi-mode uh, DA systems, and uh, that uh, this algorithm we believe is of uh, practical uh, relevance uh, in the Modelica uh, community. Uh, we have collaborations with some uh, tool, uh, Modelica uh, tool uh, developers. Uh, about uh, the um, implementation of our algorithm in their tool. Uh, so, so far we have scalable the structural analysis in uh, all mode at once uh, fashion, only for uh, what Albert called uh, long modes. And uh, it is, um, uh, and uh, Albert has uh, presented a novel uh, structural analysis uh, algorithm for mode changes. And we are uh, working on its implementation in, uh, in our tool, uh, even day. Uh, so, yes. And uh, we are also working on the modular uh, version of, uh, of our uh, uh, multi-mode structural analysis uh, algorithm. By modular, uh, I mean that you can perform uh, the structural analysis on uh, independently on parts of your model and then combine the, the partial results in, in order to obtain um, a structural analysis of the whole model. And we believe that this will allow us to scale up from a few thousand uh, equations to more, uh, 
to maybe a million uh, equations, uh, which is for us uh, the objective. Uh, so we still have uh, quite some work uh, to do, and um, uh, we are still working on, uh, on, uh, on our prototype, Isabelle, that you can try uh, online. So the link that was uh, in our slides uh, actually is a web service and you can uh, enter your model, press run, and you will get uh, the result of our tool. So in terms of strict analysis, it's not simulation. Oh, only, it doesn't do any simulation or, or field yet. Yes. Thank you for your attention. So let's, uh, let's thank our speakers today. Um, virtually or <laughs> by hand. Um, maybe what I'll do, I, I have a, several questions that are probably more appropriate for a sort of deeper technical discussion in a few minutes, but um, does, does anybody in the audience here have a, any questions they'd like to ask? Okay, I see one raised hand. Yeah, just go ahead and ask, just go unmute yourself and ask. Uh, we had for some time a raised hand from Pedro, but uh, okay. Hey, Scott, I, I have a I have a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks very much for the presentation. So uh, uh, one the question that I had was about uh, the use of uh, decision diagrams, right? Yes. Uh, uh, those, I mean, we have used decision diagrams, for example, modeling uh, mode changes that happen in uh, discrete optimization problems. Uh, and ex exactly the same uh, reason that you said, right? It gives you a compact representation of a combinatorially explosive uh, solution space. Uh, so what exactly is the decision diagram being used for? Is it used, uh, I mean, how, is it used for pruning certain mode changes or uh, uh, how exactly are you using it? Okay. So uh, we use binary decision diagrams to represent uh, the, the mode dependent structure of, uh, of a model. Indeed, so, for, so the bipartite graph. Uh, uh -huh. was shown. We are almost there. We are always there. So, so you, you can uh, imagine that in for multi-board system, instead of having one such by bipartite graph, you, you have one graph per mode. I see. Okay, so we use binary decision diagrams uh, to represent this uh, huge family of graphs uh, indexed uh, by the models. And then we use some algorithms on uh, binary decision diagrams to solve uh, the, two the two problems uh, for the structural uh, analysis. So the first problem to solve is to compute a, is to compute a maximal weight transverse for mm -hmm. each mode. Right. And uh, for this, basically what we compute on uh, is both uh, so some maximization of the weight function that is uh, and uh, and the arc max. So we we have an algorithm that does that that computes at the same time uh, the, the max and the arc max for all modes for all modes at once. Yeah. So so I so, so the result is a function of the modes that gives you. Uh, the, the maximal weight and, uh, the, subs and uh, the transverse as a subset of a graph. And how does the, the size of the diagram kind of relate to the, uh, the number of variables and... Uh, okay, so on, on the left, uh, you have one vertex per equation and on the right, you have one vertex per variable. So this can be fairly large. So. These are binary decision diagrams that have several thousand, and then you, you have one Boolean variable per each to, to encode the, uh, the matching problem. So we handle 
uh, binary decision diagrams with several thousands of uh, Boolean variables. And this works. <laughs> so, so why is it working? Is that uh, actually all these graphs have a very regular structure that comes from the sparsity of the physical mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. This is this is really essential. I see. I see. But the, the, so can I take it that the decision diagram actually has only depth two? Like it's there's only two layers, or are there many more layers in the decision diagram? No, no, there's only one layer. It's uh, only okay. yes. 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 It's, uh, so so we use uh, so uh, since we have a wave function, uh, actually we we use a binary encoding of uh, of the wave function as a as an array of uh, binary de decision diagrams, and we do uh, arithmetic. And it, uh, it's a pretty classic. Uh, on this. Cool. All right. Thank you. I'll definitely look at your paper then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So some of the details are uh, in our papers. And otherwise, it's, uh, it is not documented. Uh, we have, uh, it's a, there's a difference between uh, the, the algorithmic description in our papers and the implementation. There are lots of optimizations that are not in the papers. Sure, sure. OK, mm. thank you. So I, I would say at this point, why don't we sort of transition to a discussion uh, among those of us who are perhaps you know more yes. interested in some of the details um if if other people want to drop off that's perfectly fine um let's thank thank you one more time <laughs>